Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Okay. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. I am the steward of the Stoa, Peter Lindbergh. Uh, some of you may know I run the, the Stoic Group here in Toronto, Canada, and obviously we can't meet right now due to the situation, so I decided to launch the Stoa, which I'm viewing as not just a space to talk and practice about Stoicism, but a place to, for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And I'm bringing uh, in a lot of people to, to practice different exercises and to give talks, and uh, today we have a special guest, uh, my friend Greg Sadler. Um, Greg is a APPA certified philosophical counselor. He's the editor of Stoicism Today, and he's the president of Reason IO, uh, which is an organization that puts philosophy into practice. And he's going to give a talk today on Stoic fortitude, and it's going to be about twenty minutes, and then we're going to open up to questions, a Q and A. And if you have a question for Greg, just write it in the chat box. And uh, uh, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and you can read it. Or if you want me to read it on your behalf, just uh, indicate that in the chat. Uh, so that being said, I'll hand it over to Greg. Thanks, Peter. And uh, thanks for the invitation to come into this virtual space and, and talk about these, these things. So I am going to talk about fortitude or the, the virtue of courage, but I'm also talking quite a bit about failure and failings. And when, when Peter approached me about... Um, what topic I might want to talk about, that's what came to mind right away because I think that we don't, we don't talk about it enough in terms of uh, stoicism. I know in our local group we, we do every once in a while bring up where we went wrong and then we analyze it. But there's, you know, it's not, it's not something that people are often happy to discuss. And it's really important because any mode of intentional living, and, and Stoicism is one of those, there's going to be a lot of failings and a lot of failures. So Stoicism helps us to understand those and to wean ourselves away from dysfunctional approaches to the inevitable failures that we have. And the reason why I picked fortitude wasn't just because, you know, the alliteration, the nice F sounds or something like that. It's because uh, if, we, if we look at what the Stoics actually said about that virtue of fortitude or courage, it's broader than just dealing with fears. And it really does have some, some resources there to help us deal with the inevitable failures that we run into. So this is gonna be kind of restricted in scope. There's so much that could be said about this that I think one could actually write a small book about it. We're, I'm gonna talk, and I've already used up probably a minute of, of the time, so I'm just gonna hit on some, some key points. Um, so, you know, I talked about why this this issue, and, and I'll, I'll start by talking about a, a failing of mine that's also uh, culminated in several failures. So all of you know, if you're not involved in academia, um, all of you are still you know, quite aware that everything has had to go online. And that takes a lot of work and a lot of thoughtfulness. And I've been teaching online for eight years now. Um, so, you know, when, when we first got quarantined and told, hey, uh, we're going to extend spring break, you better start shifting the classes online. That first weekend, I thought, oh, this is a perfect opportunity. I can, like, get a lot of this work done right away. And then I found myself, uh, as many of you probably have as well, and this is a topic we could talk about as well at the end, um, you know, feeling kind of unmotivated, feeling kind of kind of blue and sad and not getting the things done that I, I said I would. And that's, you know, that's both a failure, but it's also a failing. And I'll talk about the, the difference between those in a bit, because it's, it's something that I, you know, often do uh, more often than I'd like. I create this great Google calendar full of things that I'm going to do, and then I don't actually get to them, and then I have to revise it and take stock of the fact that the work didn't get done. And who does it affect? Well, it affects my students. And it's not like I left them in the lurch, but I wanted to do all these different things that would ease their transition and keep them from feeling anxious. And I, I got maybe half of them done 
you know, on the scale that I wanted. So, you know, that's sort of a classic instance. I have some duties towards these people that I have uh, relationships with. Um, I know what the right thing is to do, and yet I find myself not getting all of the right thing done. And I think many of you uh, can bring up similar instances in, in your own, uh, just the last couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> the quarantine and the staying at home and all the, the anxieties about COVID-19 and the, the situation that we're in, I think makes this even more important to talk about because as we put more stress on the systems that we live in and we put more stress upon ourselves, we're going to make more mistakes. We're going to shift into unhealthy ways of, of looking at things. So let's talk about failings and failures. We, we often use these words synonymously as if they're the same thing. And I'm not saying that we have to be, you know, grammar police or anything like that about this, but it is useful to make a distinction. We often fail at, at things and we do so in determinate ways within situations. That's a failure. And it could be minor. It could be I forgot to uh, take the dog out and so the dog is, is upset you know, and maybe has an accident or something like that. And then it has to be cleaned up and, you know, inconveniences people, or it could be a really big thing. Like I didn't check into my classes all week and my students are wondering, where, where is this guy? <laughs> what are we going to do? Um, and, and there's all sorts of possibilities. And then when we realize that we've failed, sometimes we realize that there's something more going on there, that we have failings, that <clears throat> there's, there's things about ourselves that aren't what we'd like them to be. And, you know, our, our society is very good at giving us all sorts of uh, sometimes correct and very often incorrect information about what our failings would be. You might think about the fashion industry and how it pushes a certain, not just, uh, you know, coiffure and, and uh, uh, you know, set of clothes that should change every season, but body types and, and what we ought to be investing our time and attention into, those, those uh, can make us think that we're, fail, that we're failing when we're not really doing so. Um, so we'll, we'll, we can talk about that as well. We also see failings and failures in other people. And one of the things I think we can be on guard from the beginning against is interpreting failures on people's part as automatically signifying failings on their part. So if I, you know, neglect an email for a while and don't respond to it right away, that doesn't mean that uh, that, that failure is automatically because of a failing with me of not wanting to address people or being disrespectful or anything along those lines. But, you know, we have to be on guard against that because that's a natural tendency to read those things into other people's um, behavior. So in any, as I was saying, in any path of intentional living and personal development, we really ought to expect to fail very often when we're starting it. And, you know, I, I know just looking at the, uh, the list of people here, some of you have been practicing stoicism for quite a long time. And even then, all, all of those who have been, you can weigh in and say, yeah, we, we keep on failing as well. But when you're first embracing um, some stoic principles and practices, you're going to fail all the time. And, you know, that's just part of the course. It's just like uh, learning a musical instrument or... Um, going to the gym and starting a new exercise routine. You know, it, it, it makes sense that that would happen. And so, you know, dealing with failure productively is going to be very important for us. Um, and, and, you know, we can think about some of the ways in which we fail. And I came up with a list here. I'm just going to like hit on some of the general ways, right? Some of them are cognitive. We get mixed up in what we think or assume, or we have incorrect ideas about things, like mixing up what's in our control and what's, what's not in our control. Um, we make mistaken inferences. We follow out automatic lines of uh, thought processes or lines of reasoning that are, that are mistaken. Um, sometimes we actually just sort of make a mistake, almost like, you know, in mathematics, when we wind up with the wrong number at the end, and we're not quite sure how we got there, we get the wrong result. Well, we do that with our reasoning as well. But we also have affective ways in which we fail. 
And this is where I think stoicism can be really helpful in telling us what we what we ought to desire and what we ought to be averse to, right? Um, we often desire the wrong things or are averse to the wrong things or too much, too little. Um, we direct our emotions towards the wrong uh, objects. Um, sometimes we act on them in ways that are not helpful for us or for others. And we, we often do realize, if we've been thinking about ourselves and examining our, our, ourselves, which is part of Stoicism, that we, we should feel something better or different, but don't. And we feel that as a failure, right, on our, on our part. There's also volitional modalities. We, we sometimes choose the wrong things or commit to the wrong things, uh, the bad instead of the good. And then afterwards we say, well, well what was I thinking there? Um, we choose things that could be good but end up being bad because we don't pay close enough attention to what we're doing. We start with a good intention but don't follow through on it. Or we prioritize things in a, a way that, that gets in our own way, that hinders us, to use Epictetus' term. Or sometimes we fail to fulfill the duties that we have, and that leads us into action. Sometimes when we have an action, we don't follow through on it. We don't check up to see whether the result actually turned out the way that we assumed. Um, or, you know, things turn out differently than we intended because we, we don't act in a pure vacuum. We were within an entire matrix of, of causes that include other people and the universe itself and all of these, these processes. And so things go astray and we have to stay on top of that. So those are all different ways in which we might experience failure. And we might, you know, when we bring stoicism into the mix, in a way it kind of raises the bar. So we hold ourselves to higher standards than we would have had, we would have in the past when it comes to our choices and actions and thoughts and particularly to emotions. You know, for myself, I've struggled my entire life with anger. That's part of how I got into studying stoicism in the first place. Some of you know the backstory on that and I'll be happy to share it in the Q&A if people want. Um, and, you know, the Stoics are very zero tolerance when it comes to anger. And I can say I fail at that probably not every single day, but pretty close. Um, and so, you know, when we, we begin to hold ourselves to higher standards, we become much more conscious of where we're failing. We also do so, and I think this is a very helpful mental construct when it comes to virtues and vices. You know, when we can give a name to ways in which we don't want to be and it's bad for a person to be, and we can give a name to the ways that we ought to be that would be good for us to be, that helps us to guide ourselves. And, and you know, we often fail when it comes to the virtues. Um, the entire realm of duties or appropriate actions, of ficia in, in the, the Latin, uh, our relations to others, well, we often fail in those. I'll speak for myself. I often fail in those. Maybe some of you do as well. And stoicism, you know, reinforces for us, hey, uh, you've got all these connections to other people. Um, you really need to pay attention to them and do the right thing in, in the fabric of those relationships. And, you know, you might say, oh, well, that makes, you know, in that case, maybe we should get rid of stoicism. It just makes us more miserable, right? It's, it's not fulfilling its promise of making us happier. And, you know, we, we might want to think about the legendary sage and the fact that maybe some of you aim to be the sage. I don't. I'm, I'm a Prokopton, and I intend to be that my entire life uh, because that's good enough. You know, I just want to get a bit better and a bit better. Just like Epictetus says, hey, I don't have to be Socrates. Um, it's enough if I just make some progress along the way. And I think another thing that Epictetus says is, is helpful in this. All of you remember the, the passage from the Enchiridion about the beginner blames everybody except for themselves, right? And the person who's making some progress blames himself, and then the person who's actually uh, made a lot of progress or understands things doesn't blame anybody. And we use this as a classificatory principle. I think we should see this as a continuum instead, you know, as a process where we wean ourselves away from blaming other people and we start focusing more on what we need to change in ourselves and what we need to be, you know, um, sometimes hard on ourselves about and then eventually move away from that as well. 
it doesn't mean that we're ever going to get there entirely and not blame anybody and be totally cool with everything that's going on. Maybe that's not, not what we need to do. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is common mistakes that, that people make when they fail and how we can look at them uh, from a stoic perspective. And I think looking at them from the stoic perspective will happen more in the Q&A. But here's, here's some common mistakes and you can add your own as well. So the first one is denying that there was any failure in the first place, right? It didn't happen. And then, you know, all of you are familiar with the, the path of, well, it didn't happen. Oh, it did happen, but it, I, it, you know, it wasn't me. Oh, it was me, but I didn't intend it. Oh, I did intend it but um, it really didn't have the bad effect that, that you're saying it did, you know, all this minimizing that goes out, that is not helpful at all, right? Uh, if we fail, we need to actually acknowledge that we, we did fail. Another big problem that people uh, launch themselves into, or rather set of problems, and, and actually, when I was thinking about this, I, I realized this is a very common theme in sitcoms. A person will fail at something and then they will try to fix it by any means they can. And they don't, they don't approach it attentively. They don't approach it with prosoche, as we would say in Stoicism. They're reacting immediately. And, and the efforts that they make make it worse and worse and worse and worse until around the you know, 28 minute mark, everything falls apart. And then we have a, a nice you know, uh, coming together and we learned a lesson sort of thing. Well, you know, in real life, um, this, this approach to, towards failure often doesn't pay off that way. Um, shifting responsibilities to others, that's another uh, problematic way of dealing with failure. We, we actually need to deal with things that are our, our business, the things that are up to us. Um, ignoring how we make things harder for others when we fail, that's, that's another common thing as well. And I think if we're Stoics, we have to think about larger systems that we're involved in. So like, you know, for example, if I didn't show up until 20 minutes into this, I would be putting out however many people are, I can't, I can't tell ex exactly right now, how many, however many people were waiting for this, right? If I let, uh, if I fail myself, I let others down sometimes. And that's a matter of justice and a matter of duties. Um, another thing that often happens when people fail is excessive emotional reactions. And sometimes this can be, you know, guilt or shame. Um, sadness is a common one. Anxiety, you know, what if people think I'm a bad person because of this? Um, some of the other ones that, that come up that maybe you don't experience, but I know I do. Frustration that leads to anger and then lashing out at others, uh, which generates yet another failure, or even a de desire and enjoyment in seeing others fail, so that at least it you know, detracts from, from what you're doing. Um, another, another common mistake, I think, is being too concerned about what other people will think and not about what you're actually um, dealing with in, in the situation. So how can we approach these things as a Stoic? I think one of the most helpful principles is the dichotomy of control. Um, you know, thinking about what is genuinely up to us and, and what isn't up to us. And one thing that we definitely don't control is whether we failed or not. So, you know, once we failed, that is set and that's there in the past. And we can tell whatever stories we want about it. Um, and we can reframe things in more productive ways, but the thing happened. And if it came from something within us, a failure within us, that's still there too. And, you know, we can change how we approach it in the future, but we really can't do much more than that. Um, we will have failings and failures with respect to all sorts of things that are indifference. And, um, you know, those in fact do matter, as Epictetus tells us. The things that are indifference, like say money, um, it doesn't have no value whatsoever. It just doesn't have the value that a lot of people ascribe to it. And how we use it is important and is up to us. So we, we can think about um, those, those uh, you know, classifications. Um, prudence has to do with how we use indifference in large part. Same thing with justice, the same thing with fortitude. Um, and we probably should try to work on our skills and, and abilities that we call virtues that will help us deal well with 
these indifference. So I think that's one key thing. You know, we look at what is in our control and um, we, we, you know, focus on, on that, but we also try to maintain some focus on what we don't absolutely control, but can influence in some way, and we, we should do that well. Um, another thing is being concerned about, as I mentioned, what other people make of our, our failures. And, and Marcus has a, a, a thing that he says at one point, and Epictetus, I believe, has another thing, and Seneca has something similar, where um, somebody's criticizing somebody else, and they say, well, obviously you don't know me that well, because if you did, you know, not only would you criticize me for this one thing over here that I failed at, boy, you'd, you'd see all these other things where I'm screwing up as well. And doing that can kind of help you put things in, in perspective. I'm not saying you'd say that to everybody, but you can sort of say that to yourself in your mind and then maybe not feel as, as bad about the, the single thing that is weighing upon you. Um, realism about success rates is also very important. You know, Socrates himself, as Epictetus tells us, went around, and this is his divine mission in, in Epictetus' view, to go around and tell people, focus on your soul, don't worry so much on these other things. And what was his success rate? About one in a thousand. So if Socrates himself was not succeeding all of the time, uh, maybe we need to adjust downward, depending on what it is, our conception of what success and failure are. Maybe some of the things that we think of as failures aren't really failures. And, and you could say, well, in that case, we go back to the dichotomy of control. All Socrates could do is put the message out there and, you know, in a very assertive way, which got him killed eventually. Um, but it's up to the other people to, to take that into account. And that's not up to him. Um, we can also think about what we learn from failures as experiences. Experiences are appearances, fantasiae for, for Stoicism, which doesn't mean that they have no reality whatsoever. Even reason itself, the faculty of reason, is a system of appearances, Epictetus tells us. So we need to look at how things are connected with each other and whether we're getting them right cognitively and effectively. The last thing I would say, you know, that might be helpful from a Stoic perspective. And this is not just there in Stoic advice, but it runs throughout uh, intentional modes of living, is that we can't hope to fix everything at once. If we do have, if we discover failings in ourselves, we have to work on them bit by bit. So if I'm, you know, struggling to not drink, you know, uh, two pots of coffee a day, which I'm not going to change, by the way. I, uh, that's that's my normal consumption. Uh, there's there's other things I could focus on more, like you know what my students need from me. Um, but if I decided to make that my focus, I probably shouldn't try to do everything else at the same time. And we can remind ourselves what what is the goal of Stoic philosophy. So the stock answers are eudaimonia, right? Good flow of life and tranquility. And how how do we actually do that? What does that actually look like? The Stoics tell us, this is where we get to the nitty gritty of it, that it, it means understanding and choosing and actually doing the things that we're supposed to do, appropriate actions or duties. Uh, they also tell us, and Epictetus is like constantly stressing this, that the goal of the Stoic life is to recognize where we are in conflict with ourselves, where we are contradictions. The Greek word for that is mahe, literally battle, where we're fighting ourselves and to work through that gradually, untangling these knots that we have within ourselves. Um, they also think that we are truth-seeking animals. We want to know reality. We don't want to be screwing up all the time in how we're assessing things. So we have to be very realistic about the world and very realistic about ourselves. That means seeing where we're, we're failing. And Stoic philosophy is about a progressive transformation of the person. It's not about an on-off switch where we learn some principles and now everything turns into happiness and, and tranquility. Instead, we have to do some work. And so here's where we get to fortitude. And I, I realize I'm already going a little bit long, <clears throat> so I'm gonna keep this fairly short. So fortitude is a virtue, right? We, we often translate it as courage. In Latin, it's fortitudo. fortitudo. In, in Greek, it's Andrea. And like the other four, the, the other three cardinal virtues, it's an overarching basket of things. So what does it encompass? It does include the traditional notion of like dealing with fear, 
or anxiety, right? Being brave in the face of danger or stuff like that. Um, but it encompasses more for the Stoics. So Cicero tells us in On Duties that fear is one of the emotions that it helps us to handle. Desire is another. And anger is another as well. Those all fall within the, the scope of this. Arius Didymus, <clears throat> who, you, you know, if you haven't checked him out, he's worth, he's worth taking a look at. He gave this epitome of Stoic ethics. He talks about these five different aspects to courage or fortitude. So in Greek, I'll give you the Greek terms, and I'll tell you what, what they mean, and I'll give you his gloss on them, because he doesn't go much further than that. So the first one is karteria. And this we, we translate as perseverance, but also as endurance, depending on which translation you're looking at. And he calls this the knowledge. They're, they're all types of knowledge, episteme, but they're not like just purely cognitive. They're also, you know, with, within our habits and, and our, our feelings. This is a knowledge that, that is ready to remain in what has right, been rightly decided. So when we've decided we ought to do X, uh, perseverance helps us to do that. That's part of what it means to be courageous in this respect. So being courageous doesn't have to be running into the burning building. It could be actually doing the things that you said you were gonna do, washing all the dishes instead of saying, we'll, we'll do them in the morning, you know, to take a sort of trivial example. Another one that's a little bit closer to like the, the feeling of courage is um, tharleotes, intrepidness. Um, it's related to the word for confidence. <clears throat> and he says, this is the knowledge through which we know we will not encounter anything terrible. We can realize that we're up to the challenges in front of us, even if they happen to be, you know, like dealing with uh, uh, this terrible illness that's going on. Another one that they said fits into that is uh, megalopsuchia, which is, is often translated as great solidness or magnanimity. Aristotle treats it as a separate virtue. The Stoics thought that fit under courage. And it's a rising above. It's a rising above and sort of looking at things from that perspective. So it helps us put things into perspective. And he says it, it doesn't just apply to trivial stuff. It also applies to the stuff that's genuinely valuable. So we realize that, you know, it is valuable for us to have certain relationships, but if we have to let those go in order to accomplish a yet greater good, then we do that. Um, another one is what he calls eupsuchia, stout heartedness. Um, this is uh, something I think a lot of people are attracted to in Stoicism. It's knowledge belonging to the soul grasping itself is unconquerable, reminding ourselves that we do get to decide, that we are the ones who uh, determine what we're going to do with ourselves and our faculties and our abilities. And then the final one it, that I particularly like is called philoponia. Uh, literally meaning loving toil or loving difficult things. Um, and so this is translated as industriousness or diligence. It means being able to accomplish what's proposed without being prevented by the toil that's involved. And this is where, like, you know, we, we get reluctant sometimes. We encounter things and we're like, yeah, I've got this great idea, this intention. And then, you know, it gets kind of late at night and we're tired and we're like, oh, I'll do that later, and then it doesn't happen. That's a failing, right? And so by being industrious, we can not just keep ourselves from doing that, but we can return back to what we need to do. Um, Epictetus doesn't talk about courage much, but he does talk about all these parts. Um, he doesn't use the word virtue very often. Now, Becker himself, I think many of you know his new Stoicism, he, he summarizes these in three things, courage, endurance, and perseverance, but it covers a lot of the same ground, and he says that we, we need these in order to be able to exercise our agency that, that we ought to have. So, um, you know, this, I think, maybe is sort of like a little pep talk more than, than a deep analysis or anything like that, but it gives you an idea about how we can use this, this virtue of fortitude to approach the inevitable failing, failures that we, we see and then the failings within us that we want to work on. The last thing I'll say is, you know, the Stoics are often portrayed as saying that virtue is just a kind of knowledge, right? And that's true. They do think that there's a, a cognitive side to it. It's not just, you know, 
having a, an automatic response. You, you do need to know what you're doing and you do need to think about it and you do, do need attentiveness. Um, Epictetus talks about us as having the virtues within us as sort of resources that we can draw upon. And that's another aspect to it. Th these are all part of our nature if we choose to develop it. But the other thing where the Stoics do line up with other virtue ethicists is their emphasis on if we want to actually have the virtues available to us, if we want to have fortitude, we have to continually choose and practice, and that leads to establishing new habits. That is going to happen over time. And there's sort of a meta level here. We're going to fail at that, too. And so we have to be willing to, you know, if we want to use more of the imagery, like the wrestler, pick himself up, dust himself off, and get back in the ring again. And fortitude is the virtue that helps us do that. So fortitude develops itself in its own practice. And the last thing I'll close on is just saying, well, if you do this, it gets better. It gets easier. Um, I'm, I'm saying that from somebody who's gone a bit of the way and can see, you know, further on the horizon. Probably some of you are further along with that than I am. But, you know, the message is you can do this. You can deal with failings and failures. And it's okay. To, it's, in one respect, it's okay to fail because you're going to and you have to become okay with it. Obviously, you want to fail less, but you want to be quite realistic with yourself about what's going on. So fortitude is the thing that we need to focus on. That, that's, that's my shtick here. So <laughs> I'll open it up to Q&A. Cool, cool. So um, if you have any questions, uh, write it uh, to Greg in the chat box. And uh, I'll call on you to unmute yourself or I'll read on your behalf. And I'll warm up uh, Greg right now with uh, um, a question of my own. Or maybe oh, I'll, I'll share some thoughts and then maybe we can tease out a, a question here. Yeah. Uh, so what was salient is when you mentioned the, the sitcom thing, because uh, uh, my wife and I uh, just finished watching the whole series of Friends, and okay. I, had a, I had an adjacent thought uh, similar to that, that I noticed everyone freaking lies. In every episode, they're lying. Same thing with Seinfeld. Yeah. They're always lying. And, and you're right. The lying stems from some minor mistake or failure or whatever, and then they make it worse by lying, <laughs> right? Um, and if they were just being upfront and forthright and truthful, then there wouldn't be an episode, essentially. Uh, and what comes to mind is that Jordan Hall had the, his take on wisdom is being in the right relationship with reality, which could yeah. be just another spin with like living in accordance with nature. And so the thought came to mind, like, what is right relationship with failure? You know, similar to what you're talking about. So I just throw that out to you if, if you think that's a helpful frame or if anything came to mind. Yeah. And, and as I mentioned, um, you know, the Stoics think of us as animals that um, have these sort of basic drives towards things. And unlike the other ones, we have a drive towards truth. And that's where the, the virtue wisdom gets its beginnings from, according to Cicero, who's, who's just, you know, uh, essentially telling us what Cato said about that. So kind of orthodox Stoic teaching in that case. And, and I think that's completely right. We want to have a veridical relationship with reality and we're part of reality. So we want to understand ourselves. <clears throat> and sometimes part of, Sometimes that can be a very painful truth to see, right? You know, oh, I thought I had all my anger stuff done. And then we start, you know, talking about recipes and somehow we get into, you know, shouting at each other or something like that. Well, there's a sign that things are, are not as I thought they were. You know, it's kind of funny with the sitcom thing as you were talking about that. We, we were fans of Curb Your Enthusiasm. And Larry David is like, he, he's, he's an epitome of this. He's sort of, a, you know, he, he, he is kind of stoic about stuff with a lowercase s. You know, eh, this doesn't matter, right? But he's constantly screwing things up worse and worse and worse by making a bad decision and then trying to cover it up in some way. And yeah, uh, you know, the notion that we, we could somehow fix things by lying, okay, that's a false thing, right? So being wise would be realizing, among other things, realizing that you can't fix things just by telling people some sort of story to mollify them, but you, you have to fix the relationship somehow. And that's probably, you know, in some respects, too messy and boring to make good TV, you know? <laughs> so. Mm, yeah. So um, we'll, we'll pivot to the, the questions and uh, Sai would like me to read this. Um, so how do you apply this view to the failures versus failings of other people? Uh, seems a relevant aspect in a time when many are eager to criticize others' reactions or lack of reaction in the face of crisis. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And so we can talk about that in a number of different ways. You know, we can talk about how one, one interprets it oneself and whether, you know, whether you're doing the right thing, you could say, in relation to other people's failings, which most of the time is going to be not talking about them, ignoring them, because it's not your business. Um, you know, I, I get on Twitter, and Twitter is kind of a, a great place for everybody getting up in each other's business, um, because, you know, even the people, the people who you follow are um, bringing other people into your stream, and there might be a temptation to correct people or you know, say, oh, you're totally mistaken about this, this sort of thing. Um, and I think as a Stoic, you would, you would want to think, well, is it really worth my time to get involved in this particular situation, this particular tiff? Now, if we're talking about people closer to us, um, maybe those who we have responsibility for. So like, you know, if my kids um, are, are doing something that's not to their benefit or might be harming others, I probably should say something to them about that. And, and maybe even um, if I have any, any sway in the situation, because, uh, you know, quite often kids are, you know, they, they really are their own thing, you know, their own little world. Um, try to influence them and, and bring them towards what's good. And we could say this, maybe, you know, you think about this, I hadn't thought about this before, but you know, think about the concentric circles that we talk about with Heracles, and we usually bring this up in terms of oikiosis and you know, like uh, loving everybody ultimately out to the ends of the earth and all the human. You know, but but there's also that that more inner circle where we are more concerned with them, and we probably in in times like this probably should pay closer attention. I need to focus, for example, on my students. I don't need to, to really worry about what my dean is doing, even if um, the policies that they're, they're doing seem a little bit counterproductive. I need to focus more on, on, on my tasks. Um, there will be some people's failures that are going to be bad uh, in many respects for other people. And, um, you know, the most we can do often is say, hey, you're screwing up. Um, here would be a better path. Um, but, you know, right now, well, so we, you know, let's talk about the, the, the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, most countries have some sort of unified response at this point in time. Here in the United States, we don't. It's been left up to the individual states, and some of the individual states left it up to individual municipalities. Um, and so, you know, there have been some very imprudent decisions made um, in, in uh, recent times, and we're going to suffer the consequences for them. And, you know, strictly speaking, these have to do with what the Stoics would call indifference, you know, being healthy or sick, wealthy, you know, we're looking at economic collapse in many cases, or poor, um, but indifference do matter. And we, we shouldn't just, you know, say, oh, well, we're Stoics, so long as it doesn't affect my own virtue or vice, um, you know, I think it's okay to be critical of inadequate responses, but, you know, here we can talk about manner. How do we do that? Do we allow ourselves to get all angry and worked up about it? Um, do we start calling people names? Um, how, you know, how do we do it? And, 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 you know, Seneca himself, this is a bit of a side note, says that in some cases, even though you're not angry, it could be useful to look angry if you're dealing with people who only understand that, that point of view. He talks about a judge uh, displaying anger towards a, a uh, criminal defendant. Um, and, you know, maybe our legislators only get, you know, when we seem upset with them, but that doesn't mean that we actually have to be upset. So that's kind of a long-winded answer. <laughs> but. So, um... Next question, and just a disclaimer on the questions, we might not get to all the questions, and I'm not gonna be reading it in order. I'm gonna use my discernment to kind of like, yes, end the previous um, thing Greg said. So uh, Alex, uh, you have a question for Greg. Uh, would you like to go off mute and ask it? Um, Alex, uh, I'll unmute you if you'd like. There, you're unmuted. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, thanks, Greg, for uh, for your presentation. Um, um, I was wondering about fear and, sto and stoicism and the virtue of courage specifically. Um, 
I guess I'm wondering what happens when a person acts courageously. Um, does fear disappear completely, or is it just somehow transformed and managed? You know, uh, just puts it under our control. Because uh, I've read, I've read that for the Stoics, you know, uh, like the Stoic sage mm -hmm. uh, lives without any fear at all. Um, and I know for somebody like Aristotle, you know, fear is always going to be there, and it's just a matter of kind of managing it well. So yeah. So. Um, for Aristotle, that's, that's not actually the case. And Aristotle's closer to the Stoics on this. Aristotle says that the courageous person will feel fear in the, the face of things that are genuinely fearful, um, but they're not going to feel fear when, they, when it doesn't make sense to feel it the way somebody who, say, has a phobia does, right? Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're in the Mediterranean, in the ancient world, um, on a ship and you're in the middle of a storm it and, you, and you're the the poor guy who's got to go up above and like secure the the things that are otherwise going to move around that makes sense to be scared right? but you master you try to master the fear and not allow it to dominate you so you can do the right thing and the stoics have a similar thing so in some cases it it will mean not feeling fear and this is where the cognitive side comes in if you if you understand that some things aren't really scary, even though people say that they are, or your first reaction is to think that they are, you can, you can avoid feeling fear. Um, but even, even the, the Stoic philosopher, we won't talk about sages, but even the Stoic philosopher um, is gonna have these, these pre-emotions where the body just kind of you know, reacts to things. Um, maybe the adrenaline starts flowing and then, then they manage it. But there will be some things that will be genuinely scary. And this is where I guess I'm, I'm tempted to think that um, modern stoicism would acknowledge a wider range of, of uh, the stoics had what, what are called eupathi, right? The good emotions, the good emotional states and caution, eulabea, is one of those, and that's feeling fear when it's rational to feel fear. I think maybe we would be a little bit more uh, wide in our scope. So, you know, for example, my kids are down in Indiana right now. They're they're separated um, from from me by two states, and I know that they're doing okay living out in the countryside, um, but I can still feel some concern for them. And now does that have to rise to the level of something where I'm like calling them up all the time or texting them, how are you doing? You're not, you're not coughing or yet or anything like that, right? No, it's, that, that would be clearly off base. But um, exhibiting what the Stoics called caution, you know, that does make sense in a lot of cases. And, you know, so if we, let's think of very practical terms. We live in an apartment complex here and I have a wife who is immune compromised. Um, we have um, quite a few younger people living in, in the, the complex who seem rather cavalier about um, contagion and, and social distancing and things like that. And, you know, we have to be careful. We have to be cautious about that. Um, and so there will be some things where, you know, if somebody wants to get on the elevator with me, my, my reaction is, no, take the next elevator, buddy, you know. Um, and, and it may seem kind of rude. And I can do that without feeling, you know, oh, this, this, thing, this thing gripping me, this fear in my gut. Um, but, it, but it is still within the same affective domain. And if I see somebody doing something really dumb, you know, like, I don't know, licking the elevator buttons, I should, I should feel some sense of, you know, like the hairs on my, the back of my neck going up. Something was really wrong there. That's kind of a silly example, but you get what I'm saying, right? So, so there's, there's kind of a, a complex spectrum, you could say. Uh, in some cases, it's going to keep you from feeling fear at all because you've realized this isn't really something scary. In other cases, it will be the, the more, it seems more Aristotelian, but it is also equally stoic to work despite the fact that you're feeling fear. So uh, Ben had a question. He'd like me to read it for him. How does the Stoic concept of fortitude relate to or differ from modern notions of resilience and anti-fragility? I would say there's a lot of overlap there. Um, the notion of resilience is, is one of those things where you ask, you know, 10 experts and you get 10 different answers about what exactly it consists in. So I think we'd have to pin down what, what a person 
precisely means by it. I think it covers a lot of the same grounds as what we're talking about here is perseverance and industriousness. Um, and maybe some of what they, they call, you know, the megalopsuchia or, you know, being able to rise above things because that means being able to put things in, in perspective. Um, the anti-fragility thing is kind of an interesting take to think about, um, particularly in terms of the, how we, you know, how we bounce back from failure, right? So anti-fragile things aren't perfect and they're not like armored against everything else, but, and they, and they take some damage and sometimes even real trauma, but they're able to, you know, sort of self organize and reorganize in ways that then make them stronger as a result. And so would, would that describe what a stoic courageous response would be when you've actually failed? I think it probably would. Um, so I, I think that could be a helpful, helpful criterion. Um, are we making ourselves more, as persons, more anti-fragile by the way in which we're, we're approaching our failures? I mean, the opposite would be, oh, I failed. Oh, everything's, everything's doom and gloom. I'll never be able to like show my face or do anything again. That's, that's uh, you know, not just a lack of resiliency. That's also uh, being fragile, right? You're, you're completely shattered. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting that you ask that, too, because, you know, we're going to come back from this crisis and things are going to be changed in so many ways, um, some of them for the worse, some of them for the better, and it's going to be in response to um, what we go through. I mean, we're, <clears throat> you know, the, the more, more pessimistic predictions are we're only in the very beginning of our self-quarantining and social isolation and stuff like that. We might be going on for months and months and months. And, um, you know, the economy is gonna look quite different when we're, when we're finished with this. There's gonna be a lot of, you know, my wife uh, has a lot of connections in the uh, food and restaurant industry. They're really hurting right now. You know, a lot of restaurants are gonna go under. And what's gonna be left after we're done, um, we'll have to see how, how the whole industry is able to bounce back. And, and when we say that whole industry, we mean all these other people whose livelihoods are dependent upon it. Many people, you know, it's their entry level uh, jobs. So, you know, I guess we'll see which systems are actually anti-fragile as well. Stoic Dan, uh, you had a, a question. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, I think I might have to. Yeah, you can unmute yourself now, Dan. Great, thank you. Um, earlier in your talk, uh, Greg, you mentioned uh, that Stoics have a zero tolerance to anger. And that's usually the way I would describe it as well. But just yesterday, I was listening to Massimo talk on another call like this. And he said that sometimes a Stoic will need to show anger to snap someone into doing the right thing kind of like that rare oddity that we sometimes hear about a Buddhist teacher slapping his student. Um, so, uh, oh, but Massimo added that you should not feel anger inside. You should only display it, and this should be rare. What do you think about that? Well, that's exactly what Seneca said. <clears throat> that's, that's the example in, in on anger of the judge who appears to be angry. So displays you know, they don't display anger in the sense of, of acting from anger within them. They display the conventional appearance of anger, like raising their voice and, you know, maybe like they, they make themselves get red in the face or something like that that we can imagine. So that's, you know, that's uh, pretty straightforward. I, there is actually a, a debate about going on right now about, well, maybe the Aristotelians, um, who the Stoics, by the way, misrepresented. I'll, I'll mention as well, if we look at the, the ancient, you know, texts and stuff like that, a little bit on the, this. It, maybe the Aristotelians were, were a bit right in thinking that anger would be needed to galvanize people to doing what's um, right, you know, on, on a larger scale in terms of uh, getting our politicians to take the dangers to um, working class people. And um, I mean, here's a great example here in Milwaukee. Um, we've had 10 deaths now, and all of them have been on the north side of Milwaukee in the poor neighborhoods. 
Um, so there, there's clearly, you know, some, some things that, that need to be attended to. And I think, it, you know, could anger get the politicians to pay more attention to public health things? Yeah, the problem is that when we use anger for activism, um, like, like Seneca and Aristotle point out, anger gets away from you really easily. It's kind of a blunt instrument. And so, as Seneca says, anything that we could accomplish with anger, we could accomplish just by following right practical reasoning. And so, you know, whether or not we can get um, mass movements going with, without it, I, I don't know. But we can certainly, as individuals, act appropriately without using anger. So if I see my, my child being bullied, um, anger could spur me to um, take a stand against that, but it could also lead me to like, you know, um, going over and punching the bullying kid's dad in the face or something like that. And we, and we don't want those sorts of excessive reactions. So anger is, anger is always kind of dangerous. Even if we think a little bit could be okay, you know, if we want to use that meme, uh, we can have a little bit of anger as a treat sometime. No, you know, it's, it's still kind of, kind of dangerous to do it. Okay, so we have time for one more question. Um, okay, let's do this one. Uh, so this is from uh, Greg Lopez, our, our friend from New York. Um, so Epictetus asked us to transfer aversions from externals to our internal state. What's the balance of blaming yourself without also inflaming secondary passions about how you have a failing? Can you give an example of how you do it? Okay, that's that's a good one. And and yeah, Epictetus in, in the Enchiridion suggests transferring aversions entirely from, from externals. I think some of the stuff that he says in the discourses modifies that a bit. But let, let's say that we're actually doing this. So we're, we're trying to focus entirely inward on our own. Um, and we could look at it as failings, right? So we should be averse to being, and let's, let's use it in terms of uh, the virtues, right? Let's say we're, 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 we realize that we're a little greedy, and that means that we want to take more than our fair share of things, which then um, leaves other people in the lurch. It could be like toilet paper, for example, right? And why it hurting in this crisis? I don't know if it's been happening in Canada, but it's a big problem here in the States for, for some reason. It's the only crisis where we've actually seen this, this weird uh, behavior with toilet paper. Um, so, you, you know, you, you, you realize that you're getting caught up in the uh, hysteria about, oh, we better get out and get as many rolls as possible. Um, now, you, you, instead of being averse to not having toilet paper, if we're following, you know, Epictetus, it'd be averse to being the kind of jerk who goes out and, and takes what other people need and hoards it up. And then now that would require us to like look at well, what, what's going on with me? What's wrong with me that I do this sort of thing? And now we start to carry out some analysis. And so there's, you know, what's going to help us doing that? Um, is it like, you know, beating our breasts and saying, mea culpa? No, that's, that's not particularly productive. As a matter of fact, some people do that sort of thing precisely so they don't have to engage in self-analysis. They feel like they've gotten themselves off of the, you know, the, the, the charge that they were involved in before. We'd have to actually look, well, why am I so concerned about having this one commodity? What, what am I afraid of? What, what am I uh, being averse to? So now we're, we're engaging in, in introspection and we're using sort of stoic categories to, to do that. Um, now, how, how would we avoid um, not blaming ourselves in, in other ways? There, there's the blaming yourself, like getting yourself off, off of the hook for doing that, which is just a, a show. But what about actually feeling, oh, I'm a really bad person for doing this? Um, that's not going to be particularly productive either. How do, we, how do we avoid that? We could say to ourselves things like, well, you know, I, I screwed up and um, my screwing up makes sense given the things that I know about myself. It's not a good thing for me to do this and I'd like to move away from this, but I don't have to like, you know, self-lacerate in order to, to get past this. Or there might be other emotions too, like anger directed at other people. You know, oh, it's those, those, those other people who made me do this. No, the other people didn't make you do that. You, you, know, you have a prioracist, you have your own faculty of choice. You decided to allow yourself to get caught up in the toilet paper hoarding hysteria. So I, um, can I give an example of how I, I do it? 
Um, I mean, hopefully the toilet paper one gives a, an example, but I mean, could we think about other ways that aren't quite so silly uh, that we could, we could do this um, and other secondary passions? You know, maybe, so one interesting one, and this is where we move to where, where stoicism and, and existentialism could overlap. If you think about anxiety, the way that existentialists interpret anxiety in many cases is a, an awareness of our own freedom that realizes that we could screw up. We could screw up in, in ways that would be catastrophic. And Kierkegaard has the example of the guy who stands at the edge of the cliff and feels anxiety. He, he knows that he's not going to throw himself off because that would be stupid to do. But you never know. Maybe, maybe I would do that sort of thing, right? Um, and and I, I don't think that Stoics would be immune to that. Um, we are conscious of our, our own freedom, um, but if we understand that dynamic there, and we recognize the emotions as they're coming up and, and what they involve, the cognitive judgments that they, they imply, we can sort of short circuit them. And they won't go away entirely, most likely. I know that they, sh they, they don't for me, <laughs> right? um, but we can keep them from having the deciding voice in what's gonna happen. So they're not, they're not influencing the pro racist the faculty of choice, or the ruling principle, if you like, you know, the other term for that, the hegemonicon. Um, does, that, does that address it sufficiently, you think, or, or not? Greg, uh, did you want to respond to that, Greg uh, Lopez? Um, just not indicate on the chat or go off mute. If not then we will end here. Um, so yeah, in a moment, I'll do some closing announcements, but I thought, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say this, that if you wanna practice your stoicism, uh, this, this place of the stoa is not gonna always be a place to uh, kind of like inquire into stoicism, but we're gonna try to develop an ecology of practices where we can kind of like build this muscle of fortitude. Uh, and this is a collective, we're gonna source the collective intelligence to do this. So if you have any ideas, let, let us know, let me know. Um, so before I make some closing announcements, Greg, do you have any closing thoughts of what, what you're doing now where people can find you? Oh, um, well, you know, as I said, I'm on Twitter as Philosopher70. Um, and, you know, obviously my, my YouTube channel, um, just Google and it'll, it'll pop right up. Um, Reason.io is just reasonio.com. Um, and I do have, you know, a few other things here and there. And then I would say, um, I am editor of Stoicism today. There's a lot of, a lot of great articles that we're having coming in by guest authors. Um, so modernstoicism.com is where that's, that's cited. Um, otherwise, yeah, I, I mean, and I think what you're doing here is a really great idea. Um, I actually have, I'll talk with you later. I've got a few suggestions about people you might tap mm -hmm. to, to bring into it. And, um, yeah, I, I don't have much more to say. Very cool. And I put all that information of uh, where to find more about Greg in the chat box. Um, and I'll make some announcement about upcoming events, but Greg, thank you, my friend, for coming in today. That was a treat. You're very welcome. Yeah, and thanks, everyone, for being on the, on the, the call and giving the excellent questions that you gave. Um, so we have a bunch of events. I think we have like 16 lined up. You can go on the website, um, www. I'll write in the chat box, though.ca. Um, and also go on the mailing list there. You can kind of get updates. Today, we have one at 7 p.m. Eastern time. It's called the Foreshadowing Watch Party. So uh, this uh, animator called Lubomir Arzov, um, he did this really excellent piece called In Shadow. It has like a foreshadowing element to what's happening right now. So we're going to watch that and then we're going to together and then we're going to have an inquiry. So if you're interested in checking that, just go to the website and uh, RSVP there. Um, and lastly, I'm viewing the STOA as a gift for all of us to freely use in this time of need. If you're inspired to uh, give a gift in return, just go to the website and go to the gift economy section at the bottom and there's more information there. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>